All right, thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I'm just going to do a quick sound check, make sure that everyone, like, you can hear me okay. Does that sound all right? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we hear you. Oh, perfect, thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to bring up my file, my PDF. So hopefully you can see that okay? Can you just, um, just confirm that you can see that okay? Uh, not yet. No? Not yet. Let me try again. How about now? Can you see that now? Not yet. <laughs> It's okay. We are waiting. Okay. Um, but the voice is very clear. That's good. Uh, I need to... Yeah, yeah the voice is very, very... This is the clearest voice that I hear it within the two days. I don't know why it's not sharing. So it's still not sharing? Not yet. Uh, um, I, I will... Just a minute. Uh, you you can you can uh, just uh, sign out and sign in. We will waiting for you. Maybe it's something missing happened. Okay. Okay, I'll come back in. Hold on. Yeah 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 yeah. Sign in, sign out, then sign in. I think will everything will be clear. Okay, how about now? Yeah, we can see your uh, screen. Now, now we can yes. see. Yes. Wait. Okay, now let's get back in, sir. Now, now you can share the file. Yes, now the file okay. is great. great. Okay, we're good. We're good. Sorry about that, people. Um, <laughs> okay. All right, good stuff. Right, I'm talking today about managing risk and trading it while well, trading in financial markets. To give you a little bit of background about myself, um, I've been in the financial markets for about 20 years now. Um, I've worked under a number of different investment banks and, and in buy side asset management firms, and now working for Pepperstone. Uh, we generally uh, look after um, retail traders, derivative traders, um, taking on sort of high net worth individuals as well. Um, and we, we, we trade and we offer products across a broad range of, of financial markets. Um, I, I go to great lengths to look at ways to manage risk. And I think it's probably the most, or well, one of the most underrated parts of trading. Um, everyone focuses on, on entry points um, when the real P&L for the account over a period of time is, is, is really done by managing risk. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit today about what we're seeing in the market in terms of current risk. And I want to talk to you a little bit about strategy, about how I go about managing risk, because um, if you can get your risk management right, both on the entry point and then through the life of the trade, you will make more money um, trading. And I think this is something that we nearly really need to, to, to hone and, and get an art around. So, first of all, what, what do we consider to be risk? Well, clearly, um, losing money is the biggest risk. I mean, our job as traders is to grow the capital in our account. How we go about doing that is, is obviously beholden to your own individual circumstances, your objectives, what you're trying to achieve, um, with, and your strategies involved there as well. But ultimately, our biggest risk is we, we don't want to lose money. Um, and when we lose money, we need to make sure we're losing a small amount of money. money and when we're, when we're making money, we need to make um, a, a greater sum. And we'll talk about risk reward in a minute and the math that's involved there. Um, what do we consider to be risk? Well, I think we're seeing it now. I think sentiment. Markets are a sentiment game. Um, central banks and to an extent government have built up uh, an ever growing belief of sentiment. And as I go through my PDF here, um, I'm going to come back to this this slide. One of the things that we're talking to clients at the moment about is 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 this idea about extreme sentiment. Um, if you're an investor and you're seeing this current dynamic playing through at the moment, you know you you, you probably if you're an active manager, you've got to be involved in this market. You know your job is to 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 make money when the market's going up and and outperform. But we have got to a point now where we're seeing incredible exuberance and if i was an investor i'd be sitting there looking now at the risks that we're looking through across the pipeline what could cause a snap um if i'm a trader then we trade the conditions long and short across multiple asset classes we're magnetized towards movement and for the type of movement that you're seeing in the market will determine your strategy and whether you actually want to be involved in the market 
I brought a couple of indicators which which show what I'm looking at, and there's there's a whole heap. I'm writing an article to tomorrow for clients, and, and happily anyone in the room who who wants to get a hold of the article, um, we can do. So the first thing I'm looking at here is 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 just the extreme sentiment that we're seeing in the market. So if you can look at the top left, I've got the Goldman Sachs risk appetite appetite indicator. Now this looks across, I think, 27 different types of market and, and gels it into one index. So you can see the very the various components on 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 the right hand side. So we're looking at high yield credit relative to investment grade spreads. When they get to a certain level, you know that's that's saying that we're we're seeing extreme um, exuberance and confidence in the market. Credit spreads at the moment are very very tight. It's incredibly cheap for businesses to borrow money at the moment, and they're doing so in spades. Um, they've used this sort of equity emerging market versus developed markets, cyclicals versus defensives, and, and you can see the sub components that go into this. But ultimately, we're now really two standard deviations above the long-term mean. Um, there's very few situations where um, the risk appetite has become so compelling and so strong. Question is, is what's gonna continue to push this higher? The amount of wriggle room that the market has now to get it wrong is very, very low. If we, we don't know what's gonna cause a snapback, but we know that there's exuberance in the market, extreme exuberance in the market. Have a look at, um, you know, I can look at, um, you know, companies which are not, which don't generate any profits at the moment, and they're considerably outperforming um, the Nasdaq. They're considerably outperforming, um, you know, cyclicals, any kind of metric at the moment. That tells me the fundamentals are broken in the market, and people are just buying, and because they're just they're just unadulterated exuberance. Have a look on this right hand side. This is the total volume that we're seeing in OTC markets, over the counter markets in terms of equity volume and total trading volume. Look at that spike up that we've been seeing here. I mean, that tells you just the, the sheer level of exuberance that we're seeing. We can talk about the total call options that are going through. It's a similar metric. Have a look at the, lo the, the number of total margin debt um, as a percentage uh, change over the last month, nine months. It's never been this high. It, it's over 60% increase in margin debt. So people borrowing money to, to fund their, their equity purchases. If you have a look at fund flow data, which is so key for, for institutional traders, um, there's been a huge influx into, into mutual funds and ETF funds. And I, I, can, I, can, I can talk about a whole heap of different uh, indicators that tell me there's so much froth in this market that if there's a miscommunication from the Fed, um, if there's a downturn in economics, if real bond yields start moving higher, um, this market's, the, the, the elastic band has been pulled so far. Now, it feeds into my point of managing risk. When you see sentiment at such extremities that we're seeing at the moment, um, as an investor, you're, you're looking for the signs of what could, could cause that elastic band to break. Um, and I'm looking at things like fund flow. I'm looking at real real treasury yields, inflation adjusted treasury yields. I'm looking at the US dollar. If the US dollar starts moving higher and the rate of change is always key. You know, this market, I'm talking about the S&P, I'm talking about global equities, I'm talking about um, risk currencies, I'm talking about commodities, which are obviously been booming. Um, we're looking for the signs of what could cause a, a material downdraft. It might not happen anytime soon. And of course, timing is key. But what you're going to see is volatility pick up. So for me, as a as a risk manager, I've seen that there are some red signals out there at the moment that tell me that the sentiment is so extreme that we could see a material down path. Now, what went, what's going to cause that? We watch price, and as traders, we manage we watch price action, we react to price action, we react to higher volatility measures. But this is something that we're talking to clients at about the moment. There is so much ex exuberance in the market. When it if if it does, it might might be another couple of months. But when it does, it's you know there's so many people on one side of the ship. This is what I mean by extreme sentiment. You go back to this this table here. You can see that in um, in March we got down to an all time low in this risk indicator. And of course, the Fed came out on that Sunday and delivered a whole raft of various liquidity measures to the market and alphabet soup of, of liquidity measures. And the market has just gone on an absolute tear ever since. But you can see that, that the, the sentiment was so extreme to the downside that it didn't take much for a nice snapback to come in. And really, I mean, that's exactly what we've been seeing. The opposite is now true. We're seeing extreme positive sentiment. What do I mean by managing risk? Um, well, if we're in a trade or we're, we're looking to get into a trade, um, 
I look at the calendar like everyone else to see what what sort of events could could come out. I'm looking at the permutation of those events, what could happen, um, you know, depending on the size of the misc. Is this fitting into the narrative of the market that the Fed care about? Um, you know, job. What's it, what? What is it? That, you know, what is it? The data point and how how sensitive do we think markets are going to be to that? Um, and I'll show you a little trick that I use to understand if the market's understanding risk um, and, and risk events going forward. Uh, what do I mean by risk? Missed opportunity. Um, we've, we've certainly seen that in in a lot of the gaming stocks. We've been seeing that in in Bitcoin. Um, you know, this idea of fear of missing out. Markets can be driven by emotion. If you see um, a market going on an absolute tear, the idea of missing a trade or this fear of missing out can be an incredibly emotive experience. Um, there's nothing worse than watching your neighbor get rich. Um, maybe your, your, your brother-in-law getting rich, but certainly there's nothing worse than your brother getting rich and, and or your neighbor getting rich. And watching them make loads of money in Bitcoin makes you want to be involved in that as well, even though it's had a, a you know, an excremental um, rally. So I think the idea of, of, of FOMO and emotional trading is a risk. Um, we talk about concentration risk. Um, as a currency trader, uh, as part of my strategy, you know, I'm always looking at correlations in, in markets. So I know that there's a, a high correlation between, say, the Australian dollar and the Kiwi dollar, and to a lesser extent, the Canadian dollar. Um, and I understand that if we have a, a material correlation coefficient between those two assets, and if I wanted to buy the Aussie dollar and the Kiwi dollar, I would effectively have the same position. So it's doubling up because the correlations are so high. If we do see a material breakout in volatility, you know, having some, um, some having everything correlated to that risk on trade, um, i.e., you know, equity markets going up bond yields going down, the dollar going down, commodities going up. It's all one trade, really. So, you know, there's a big correlation in markets that are going through. And of course, liquidity. Um, when we see higher volatility in markets, we tend to see poorer liquidity. Markets can move much more readily on a dime. You know, you can see those kind of V-shaped moves on an intraday basis. And what you'll tend to see is, is bid offer spreads will widen as a result of less, liquid, uh, less liquidity in the market. You know, when you're seeing um, uh, more liquid environments, you'll see yeah, bid offer spreads going to, to pretty close to zero uh, in things like euro dollar. Um, you know, gold spreads will come in. It will be much cheaper to trade. And so that's what we mean. So these are the sort of risks that, that we're looking to manage um, going forward. But what we're seeing at the moment, um, you know, I think this is, this is one thing is, is as a from a macro oversight, which dictates my sort of trading. Um, you know, we're still bullish on the market because sentiment is extremely high and markets are trending higher. Um, but we're also really cognizant right now that that, that, that sentiment is, is completely ex is at extremities. So we're going to go into um, understanding risk to reward dynamics. So I've got my sort of oversight um, that are coming through. Now, for, for me personally, when I'm managing my risk and I'm looking at my risk to reward, this to me is, 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 the, is the ultimate chart. It, it's widely under, misunderstood by, by a lot of new traders. I think professional traders um, have their own mentality behind this. Um, but effectively, the risk that you take on a trade um, needs to be defined by movement and volatility in the market. It needs to be dynamic and it needs to be uh, subject to the account size as well. So the amount of risk that you take on in the position or where your stop loss is going to be defines your risk. And that's determined by volatility and movement in the market. If there's less volatility and less movement in the market, you know, you can afford to have a closer stop, a tighter stop. You're taking less risk on, so you can adjust your position size to a greater level. Um, if there's greater movement and expected movement in the market, you 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 will have a wider stop. I will tend to have a wider stop loss on the trade. Um, but as a result of that, I need to compensate and my, my, my position size will be taken down accordingly to that. So my, my, the risk that I'm taking and, and where I place my stop is, is not necessarily just where a swing low is or a trading low has been or a trading high if I want to go short but it's determined by the movement that's in the market. And that movement and where I, the risk I'm taking on will determine how much um, uh, how much what my position is going to be doing, but it also will determine what I need to target as my reward. 
Now, my strategy tends to work about 40% of the time. I don't have the, the world's greatest win-loss ratio. Um, last year, I got about 45% of my trades correct, which to a lot of people in this room will say that's not very good. Um, but that's fine. I, I've got no problem with that. Um, because at the end of the day, it's about making money. Now, how do, how do I try and make money? What's my, what's my strategy? I want to do it in a disciplined way. Um, and for me, what's, what's important here is that if I risk a dollar, I, I need to make one and a half dollars per trade, or at least I need to target one and a half dollars per trade. And the maths that involved means that I can be wrong 60% of the time. I can win 40% of my trades right and still make money. So for me, I know my strategy works. Uh, as a result of that, of course, a lot of new traders will want to target, you know, I want to win 91% of the time or 90% of the time. That's fantastic. In an ideal world, I'd win every time and I'd make one and a half times R. Doesn't work like that for me. So for me, trying to make, extract the most out of a trade is, 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 is absolutely essential. So I'm going to risk a dollar, but I need to target one and a half dollars. Um, a wise man said that you know, you, as a trader, you're managing risk, you're managing losing trades, the winning trades take care of themselves. And, you know, I disagree with that personally, because I find it very, very easy to take a loss. I'm very easy. I'm very comfortable with stopping a trade before it hits the stop, because when the facts change, I change. Um, what I find very difficult is knowing that I have to target one and a half times my risk um, as is running that trade to as far as I can. And if it looks like it's going to go further than that, can I get two times? Can I get three times? As a macro trader, can I get 10 times? And that's something that's very, very hard to do in things like effects when markets whip around quite readily. You know, you're seeing those movements in stocks where you've seen them trending beautifully and you can get 10 times R quite comfortably. But in, in gold and, and oil and um, in industry trading, uh, being able to extract the most out of the trade is, is the hardest part for me. So I'm easy taking a loss very comfortable taking a loss and sometimes I do it before my stops hit um, but getting the most out of the trade um, is the most important situation and for anyone who says um, that, that you never go broke taking a profit well you know that's exactly why retail traders do go broke because they also have a small win a small win a small win a small win and a massive loss and a massive loss and a small win so they end up getting a, an 80 percent win loss ratio but they're effectively looking, they're risking 50 to make 10 and, and they end up blowing up their accounts as a result of that. So this to me is, is absolutely key. When I'm going into the trade, I know that I'm going to make probably in a year 45% of my trades right. But as long as I'm targeting one and a half times what I'm risking, then I will make money over that period of time. And I'm comfortable with that. So how do I make a place to trade? So I've got gold here. Um, and... I'm just using this as an example to show that risk reward. And what I've done is I've used my, my charting system here and I've just done a, a basic situation where we can see um, the 30 day high, the red line here. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but you, you've effectively got this, this red line here. You can see the stop loss just above this these series of highs. And I've just put it there just for, for the argument's sake, because I'll go into my, my strategy in a minute. How do I define um, that distance to my stop loss? in a moment but you can see here that i've got my my entry point which is um the the green line which is just the line just below the sl and that's my entry point um i wouldn't actually take this trade on myself i wouldn't be going short i'm just giving you an example uh the positions above the five day exponential moving average um so but i'm giving you an example if i was to go short right now i've got my stop loss just above these series of highs um, and you can see that if, if I draw a one and a half times R, which is a function that I've used on MT4, um, you can see that I've got my target here down at price tip, price target down at um, down at these levels here. So really, I'm going into the trade. I've got my stop loss above these highs, above the 30 day highs, above this 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 sort of ceiling of supply that's come in around um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I'm looking to target. Um, down to here. So that's the basic setup and that's the mentality that I've got to have and I've got to look to try and extract the most out of that trade. Okay, so when I'm looking at the distance to my stop loss, um, I use volatility. Volatility is, and I've done many webinars around this, is, is the epicenter of markets. Um, for people who haven't really studied volatility, it's you know, there's two types of volatility, realized and implied volatility. Implied is what I tend to use more. 
most retail traders and most new traders will use uh, historic or realized volatility. But volatility is the true asset class. It is the only asset class. And what I mean by that is if you're long the US dollar, you are short volatility. So you're long volatility. If you're long um, US treasuries, you're long volatility. If you're short equities, you're long volatility. If you're going short the US dollar, long commodities, if you're going long the Aussie dollar or, or long equities, you're effectively short volatility um, and making a play that volatility is going to fall and that the world's going to be OK. So really, there's only there is only one type of uh, asset class, and that's long volatility and short volatility and everything else sort of arounds around that. Volatility for me is the cost for protection. It's the cost to hedge. We use things like the VIX index, which we'll talk about in a minute. Volatility will change the cost to trade, the spread in the market. I talked about that with liquidity. Volatility affects the time in the market. OK, so if you've got higher volatility, my position sizes or my time in the market is generally shorter. I do not want to be in front of I do not want to have a position open when I'm not in front of the screens. We go back to February and March of last year when we saw the extreme volatility. My systems didn't work and I closed down most of my positions. I didn't want to be in the market. The volatility was too extreme. <laughs> was too extreme for me. And what I meant um, when, when volatility was too high, um, you've got these huge fluctuations in the market. And it um, caused some, some extreme. Okay, cool. Okay, so in terms of volatility, what do we use? Um, well, most professional traders will use realized volatility. So looking at um, the degree of movement in a market up or down, or what we call variance, and we measure that in standard deviation um, from a sample mean. So if we're using a 20-day um, period, for example, we'd look at the, the degree of movement that price has from a mean, and we use that as an annualized number. So a lot of professionals will use realized volatility, and that's an annualized number. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, at Pepperstone, we offer um, auto chartist, which, uh, part of MT4, which is a way of looking at price at a certain time each day. And it looks at that, that, that price um, over the last six months, and it will do two standard deviations of that price up or down and project uh, a level onto the chart. Or so one standard deviation. So it basically gives you uh, an area um, where based on price of that time each day, it, it sort of it portrays a level where, where price is likely to stay in within that band. A lot of people will use Bollinger Bands. Um, and Bollinger Bands really use the technique here, if you can see on the left, the statistical probability in trading. And this is uh, for, for people who are not au fait with, with statistics, I apologize. Um, but this is what we call a normal distribution. And it's really essential for people who are using indicators like Bollinger Bands. This is the whole mentality of the whole situation. In a sideways trending market where you've got the 20 day moving average moving perfectly sideways, the RSI is around 50. You will see um, the, the prices um, captured 68.2% of the time in a normal distribution in that situation um, in one standard deviation. Now, the reason we use Bollinger Bands is because it has two standard deviations from the 20 day moving average, which means it captures 95.4 percent of price moves. This is why everyone loves using a Bollinger Band, because if it's trading sideways, you can use it as a mean reverting tool. Uh, and effectively, you can see that price will be captured. Price moves will be captured from that 20 day moving average 95% um, of the time. So if price goes above the top Bollinger Band uh, in that sideways trending market, you've got that element of, of confidence that it's going to come back towards the mean at some stage. And that's what we use. And again, this is statistics coming through. We use average true range. Um, and this isn't really volatility, but it's statistics. We can use um, pivot points and also regression. I don't tend to really use too many of these. I use auto chartist. 
Uh, a lot of people will use average true range and average true range gives you a good sense of, of the movement in the market. I'm just cognizant of time. So I'm going to whiz through this one here. As you can see here with the realized volatility measures, again, what I've done with, with dollar yen, as you can see here right now, is again, I'm using statistics. And what I've got is a standard deviation channel um, on, the, on the dollar yen weekly chart. And I've drawn it from this high here, uh, from, from um, this swing high near the 200 day moving average. Again, I can't, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. And I've started the, the channel down here and it's basically working off the line of best fit and then portraying two standard deviations, which again capture 95% of the outcomes or the potential outcomes um, uh, into those top trends. And you can see here that we've got this, this, this horizontal level of resistance levels. And, and again, you can see the market has respected it, um, not just in terms of the, the, the channel, um, but also against these highs. We've drawn a Bollinger Band on the weekly chart and what Bollinger Bands do is when they, when you see those widen, it's telling you that the dispersions from the mean are widening. And when they're closing, they're telling you that the volatility is subsiding. So, again, that's quite useful in, in that regard as well. When those bands are widening, you're seeing high degrees of, of statistical volatility. And when they're narrowing, you can see less volatility and that plays into your risk. OK, so I want to go into what I use, and this is what something that we put out to clients on a regular basis to help them understand the expected movement. So for me, why look backwards and look at realized volatility measures, which most retail traders use when um, we can look forward at what the market's expecting? And this is why it's so powerful, because using options, which is something that I, I use with my Bloomberg terminal and I get. Uh, I pull off their implied volatility. We can understand what the market is expecting in terms of future movement around event risks and based on current news and what they're expecting and use that to guide our stop losses. So rather than use all these indicators which are, are lagging and use re, um, actual data, we're looking at what the market is expecting, what the institutional money is expecting in terms of movement up and down. The first thing I do um, is have a look at the trend and the power in the trend. Um, and what I've, I've, I've created a, a spreadsheet, which I can't, I can't show you right now, um, but it gives me a sense of, of movement and, and the strength of, of the underlying position. And I want to follow the money. I want to, I want to trade with the, the, the flow of capital and it directs my bias. So when I talk about this, this extreme buildup of, of euphoria that's in the market, and when I see this change, then my, my view on the world will change. If we take an example of cable, you can see midway through there, sterling against the US dollar. Um, that was trading at the, when I printed this out midday, 138.37. What I like to see is, is price above the five day exponential moving average. Um, you can clearly see it is by, by some way. Is it above the, the, the sort of medium term uh, or the, the slightly longer term 20 day uh, simple moving average? Again, yes, it is. So I've done this conditional format to tell me that. that the price is above both of those and it's giving me this green bullish um, signal. Is it above the central pivot point? Um, again, you know, pivot points are based on previous um, previous day's movement. Um, and you can see here that, that it's 48 pips above the central pivot point. So again, that's bullish. And then I've, what I've done is I've got the conditional formatting to say, um, is the RSI um, above 60? And I like the RSI to be strong. A lot of people say oh, it's above 70. I'm going to short a market because it's telling you that it's too much priced in. I disagree with that. If the RSI is high, then it tells me that price is moving higher. And what we can see with cable here is that all three conditions are aligned. And therefore, I'm going to take a bullish bias on that. So immediately I come in the market. And these are some of the markets that I look at. And I'm, I'm dictated. I want to see a confluence of, of, of agreement amongst those things. You can see here the, the, the Japanese market, the Nikkei. You know, that's been got all three there. So again, I'm, I'm, I magnetized the chart because it's telling me that the flow price is above the short term moving average, the medium term, it's above the, um, the central pivot point and the RSI is high, moving higher, but it's not at extremes. I love that. That's a great scenario for me to be in. Immediately, I'm magnetized. So let's go to the pound because I just want to use this as an example. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, a table I put out to clients and you can sign up for my research. I'll show you afterwards and you can get this as well. 
But I, what I use is a thing called implied volatility. Now, if we go to cable, we can see that 6.7%. What that means is that's the options, that's an input that's set by the market based on options pricing for cable. And we're using overnight options. And I'm pulling this data out of Bloomberg, and you get this from options brokers and bits and pieces, but we're finding this, and, and that implied volatility, what that is, is an annualized number. But it's telling me the market says using overnight cable options that on an annualized basis, the pound is going to rally or fall 6.7%. Okay. So if you look at Aussie CAD, it's saying that using overnight Aussie CAD options at the money of the options, the Aussie CAD would rally or fall 6.4%. Now, that's an annualized number. We want to break that down into a daily number. Now that we know that volatility, this is where it starts getting a bit mathematical, and I apologize for this, but it's really powerful stuff, and I think people should know how to do it, and I can give you a lot of education around this. But what we're doing is, what we're doing then is, is the volatility is the square root of time. Okay, so if we get that 6.7 number, and we divide it by 15.9, there's um, 252 trading days in a year. If we get the square root of that, it's 15.9. So we're trying to get an annualized number and break it down into a daily number. And this is an, everything's quoted in annualized numbers. So 6.7%, and if we divide it by 15.9%, uh, 15.9, we get a daily move up or down of 58 pips. So the market is using overnight options to trade, calls and puts, and it gets an implied volatility, which is a key component of the pricing of options. If we understand, the market's looking ahead at all the data that's coming out, all the known event risks and, and taking an agreement of where things have been and saying that we think that cable is going to rally or fall with a 68.2% level of confidence, 58 points. Now, if I project that 58 points onto the current price there, I then forget a range of 137.88 to 139.04. This is the same principle as a Bollinger Band but I'm looking forward. I'm not looking backwards like a Bollinger Band, which is using prior prior prints. It's using the 20 day moving average of, of, a, of a price. This is actually looking forward in the market, looking at the risks and telling me that they see a move of 58 points. And I can use one standard deviation, which we know is 68.2% level of confidence that it's gonna stay in with that range. Or I can use two standard deviations, which is just 58 times two, and it will tell me the movement there. So I know on an intraday basis that the market is implying that there's a 95% chance that cable is going to stay within these levels here. If I have a look at gold, 17.8%. Okay. If we divide that by 15.9 to get a daily, take that annualized number down to a daily implied number, we can see that it's going to move by $21 or 210 pips effectively. So we've now got a range what the market's expecting it to trade with 68.2% level of confidence and then 95% level of confidence. So how am I managing my risk? I'm using the market to tell me what they think and projecting that image on there. It's important then to understand, to put that implied volatility into context. Again, going to that cable number, 6.7% doesn't really mean a lot um, if we don't understand if it's high or low relative to where we've been. If I look at this chart here again, which is I'm just charting that, that number um, from Bloomberg uh, over the last three years, you can see this blue line here is the average. And then we've got one, two, three standard deviations above that and, and three standard deviations below. You can see we're actually below the average. So even though we're seeing cable moving higher and we're seeing it looking to break out, um, the actual implied volatility for the overnight is actually pretty low. So things I look at that and I can put that into context and I can say, well, you know, like, I know that's 58 points, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, the market's not expecting fireworks. They're not expecting big moves to play out. I can also use weekly options. And this is something I do every Sunday and I put this out on our Telegram channel and I put this out to clients. So rather than just look at it on the day, when I, when I, when I place a trade, I'm, I'm going to use overnight implied volatility. I'm going to use that, that expected move to set my stop. But we can also use weekly options. So in the, in the week, again, we're using that volatility and we divide it by 7.1 this time because there's 50 weeks in a year. A square root of 50 is 7.1. 
So if I get that volatility there and I divide it in cable, which is using weekly options this time, we can see the market's implying 120 pips up or down over the week. So if I'm looking at my um, calendar and I'm saying, wow, you know, we've got the Bank of England meeting, we've got a Fed meeting, blah, blah, blah. What's the market expecting in terms of movement over the week? And they're saying 120 points. So it's forward looking. This is the only measure that you can get on the chart, which is forward looking. And we do this across different markets as well. And you can have a degree of confidence. We use this for mean reversion, but we also use it for stop setting. OK, so let's use this in principle. Um, I don't know how well you can see this chart, so I apologize. Um, but I've got I've got the cable set up. I've got the pound set up. Um, and we're using that level of, of implied movement to place a trade. And we can see that price, where we just got these red, ar red arrows, um, has broken above this uh, resistance here, this blue um, sort of rectangle shape. So price has broken out. It's cleanly broken out. We've got this, this ascending trend line as well, which price has broken out and we've tested. Um, and we want to look to try and place a trade just on that this trend line again because what we want to see is, is that come down to, to test this trend line um, around 138.08 um, and then we want to see uh, a bounce off that level um, to confirm uh, that that is now support and of course now we're going to start attracting buyers this is going to take a leg up so I'm going to leave an order just on this trend line um, at 138.08 um, if I go back to um, my volatility measure, you can see in cable that the market was predicting 58 points, and that's with a 68.2% level of uh, confidence. That's one standard deviation. We can take it further, and we can increase the confidence levels. So what I've done is I have increased the, the confidence levels, and I've put my stop 86 points away. That 86 points um, takes us below the uh, prior breakout highs. It also is in line with the five day average true range, which is 86 points. Um, and what I want to do as a result of that is now I've got this statistical level of confidence in my head that it's around about 75 percent level of confidence. The market is not going to breach there. It's also below these resistance levels. It's below the trend line. It's below this, this breakout level. And so I think if, if the price breaks through there, then I'm clearly wrong and it's potentially going to make a lower. I want out of the trade. I want nothing to do with it anymore. This is a this is a failed trade. I get them wrong. I want out. The next thing is, is placing my um, is my risk reward. So I've I've set my stop loss, which is this lower black bar. OK. And that stop loss is going to be 137.22, which is effectively 86 pips away. Using the auto chartist risk calculator, it looks at my my account size. It says, well, if you're going to take 86 points and they ask me how much risk do I want to take as a percentage of my equity? So in the case, usually I'd use around two percent. But because volatility is quite low, as we saw in that chart, it's, it's below the average. I can afford to increase the amount of, of my equity in my account to a slightly higher number. Now, based on the uh, number of, of percentage of equity that I want to use and how much risk I'm taking on, the system is telling me that, that I, I need to my contract size should be half of half of a contract. OK, so that's the amount of exposure that I'm going to have. So effectively, I'm going to have um, just over 50 grand's worth of exposure towards the pound. Um, and you can see there that I've got my stop loss here. I've put my risk reward, I need to be targeting one and a half times R. And so for, for the amount of risk that I'm taking, which is this amount here, I now need to be taking or chart, trying to achieve one and a half times that. But this is my setup. This is what I do. I'm using the market to tell me at a minimum how far away my stop loss should be. I've, got, I've actually gone slightly further away from that. So I've taken my confidence level that price is not going to breach that to a higher level, which is actually in line with the average true range. I now know how much my stop loss is going to be. So I can therefore understand how much I need to target. And it means I can, if I try and actually, if it breaks out there and continues to move up, then, then I'll try and hold that where I can. In fact, one of the things that we can try is the idea 
um, of adding to winning positions. And this is a mentality that I try and teach clients all the time. You know, rather than actually going in there looking to take profits too early, if something's working in your life, you do more of it. You know, you try and do as much as what works as possible. If you like running, you'll run every day until your knees go. But you'll run every day. If you, you know, if you bite your tongue, you don't like doing it. You try not to do it ever again. Why can't we use that same concept in trading? Why can't we sit there and say, if something's working in a position, why don't I add to that trade? So I've got my trade. Why can't I build into that? If it starts looking good, the, cap, the flow of capital is working towards it. Why stop at one and a half times R? Try and get two times R. Try and get three times R. The probability of getting that's very, very low, but maybe that's something we need to do. Let's have a look at one more trade and then I'll go to some questions. This is the gold trade. If I go back to um, if I go back to gold, we can see that the market is telling me there that with a 17.8% annualized volatility based off daily options, we divide that by 15.9. The market is saying that we're expecting a move of $21 up or down, which gives us a range of, of, of 1863, 1822. Okay. So I'm having a look at my gold trade. And you can see here that I've put a stop loss um, about $20 away. It should actually be a little bit wider than this. Um, it should be, yeah, it should be $21. I'll actually should be a little bit higher than that. But what the system's now doing is, I'm te is it's telling me that um, based on uh, the implied volatility, um, I'm going to have my stop loss here, even though um, you can see these highs around here. I probably should have it just above that level. Um, but again, you can see that the, um, the, the implied volatility should, is probably just a little bit higher than where it is there. So probably take a little bit more risk or not much. Um, and then you can see that I need to be targeting one and a half times R down, down at these levels down here. But again, um, the system has told me that based on this stop loss here, um, my position size, because of the amount of risk I'm taking, 21 or $21 or 206 uh, pips, um, based on that I'm going to risk 2% of my account on, in terms of equity, I'm going to be doing a, a trade size of zero spot zero eight lots. Therefore, I'm, I know my risk. And it's given me the correct position size for the size of my account and for the amount of risk I'm taking on that. Um, so that's really the, the setup today is, is what I'm trying to teach is, is two, twofold, is, is understand the risk that's in the market. Have a system which tells you what to identify. What are the triggers for, for greater volatility? Because volatility is, is, is the key risk in the market. If you have low volatility, it increases liquidity in the market. It means it has great impact on, on your position size, how much risk you're taking on. If you see higher volatility in markets, it will mean that you're going to see less liquidity in the markets. It means your time in front of the screen needs to be more adaptable. You need to be in front of it the whole time. You know, you're, you can't necessarily trade off daily charts or four hour charts. You might have to take it down to 30 minute charts. That might not suit your strategy. So understand the volatility that's that's in the market um, and based on that. The other thing is, is that rather than using necessarily ATRs and Bollinger Bands and and, and realize volatility and all these statistical motions that, that everyone's taught, um, pivot points, all, all these factors, we can, we can offer a structure where you can actually look forward at what the market's expecting, and we, we combine this by pulling out this from, from, from our systems, um, and then we can actually put a mathematical level of confidence on that. So do have a look at the, the implied volatility, because what we can do is we can actually portray um, expected movement, which we can use in our risk systems. So I'll leave it there, but the, the concept here is that we're understanding how much risk we're taking on in a position if we can understand how much risk we're taking on with a level of confidence, we can therefore understand the sort of rewards that we need to be targeting in a trade and how we can manage the emotion to try and extract that, which is key. So risk in the market, it's not the sexiest of subjects, but it's for me the most important because it covers not just the risks of, of, of what's going on and the changes that could happen, but also when you're entering a trade, understanding the expected movement 
grazed into into managing risk, your position sizing, which for me is is absolutely the most essential part of trading. So I'll leave it there, um, and I'll open it up to any questions that people have um, uh, uh, around um, what I've just said there. So I've just opened. Um, if anyone's got any questions around uh, what I've said, so uh, people feel free to to speak up. I've I've just I've enabled the microphone so people can can talk about some of the strategies and factors we just mentioned there. Can I start? Please. Yeah, there's uh, three questions. First of all, thank you so much for this great uh, session. Uh, really, your voice is clear, the clearest actually within the two days, and and also the the, the way that you. BDF is very nice. Secondly, Thank I you. need to ask you about the sentiment, the measurement of the like the chart that session, the BDF. It's look like a bear and a bull market, right? It's indicate for the the, the bull and bear market. Um. So the Goldman, you're talking about the Goldman Sachs um, risk appetite indicator, the one with the 27 yeah. variables on it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I can, if you want, I can bring that back up again. Um, yes, please, because I, I need, I need to understand how, how we can, if we can talk about the sentiment. So I think it's much better to to see the bull and bear market, so we can make like buy hold position. That's what you are indicating, right? Can you can you see my presentation again now? Yeah, I see it okay, very cool. well. <laughs> okay, so this um, part, yeah, this is the third chart. It yeah. looks like hectic and the crazy one, yeah. Yeah. So on the left hand side, what what they've done is they've they've aggregated, um, yeah, all of these these components, and and they've just done it into an algorithm, which just just, just into a into an index, which they just aggregate. Um, and they, I have seen some research on the on the predictive powers of this, but the whole point is that these are risk measures. They've taken risk measures in the market. So, you know, look, we're looking at equity volatility. So we use the VIX index. Um, I didn't touch on the VIX index there, but the VIX index is 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 such an important part for me. I trade a lot of indices, and the VIX effectively is. Um, uses 23 day and 30 up to 30, between 23 and the 37 day um, strikes on S&P volatility and aggregates and weights them up to, to create a 30 day implied volatility. So what you're looking at with VIX, which you can trade with Pepperstone or a number of brokers, um, is the expected movement um, in the S&P over the coming 30 days. And it's an annualized number like all of the other things I've been talking about. Um, you could have the V stocks, which is the, the 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 European stock markets implied volatility using their options. You can have skew. So the skew is looking at um, puts versus calls, and then you've got the put put call ratio. So the put call ratio looks at the absolute number of puts versus the absolute number of calls, whereas skew just looks at um, put volatility and minuses or call volatility and minuses put volatility. This is all quite, you know institutional sort of stuff and it, it takes some some studying but basically all of these are, are considered to be risk proxies you know if, if markets feeling good then you know small caps if you go to equity are going to outperform large caps um, you know financials are going to outperform staples um, you know European investment grade credit is going to work well so you know all of these are, 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 are what they call risk proxies like risk being a positive situation and then there's also ones which uh, work well in a more defensive market where markets are going down. And what you're doing is, is they all tell you the same thing, but they're different asset classes. And so if you aggregate them all together, um, what you do is you end up getting a situation where these markets are pushing higher. If all of these risk proxies are moving up together, um, it tells you that, that they're all working in unison. Um, and now we've got to a point where the aggregation of all of these different measures have got to extremities. So the risk appetite indicator using incorporating all of these different measures has got to, um, you know, effectively this whatever 1.2, whatever that level is. But I mean, I can do this on my Bloomberg chart because we can we can cope it. And it's effectively two standard deviations, which is, again, we capture 95 percent of the, 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 the outcomes relative to the mean. 
And it's got to extreme levels there. So all of these risk measures which they've put into here, aggregated together, and where we are in, in that measure, um, it, it's got to a, an extreme level. Now, that doesn't mean that the market's going to collapse tomorrow. But it doesn't mean that at all. What it tells you is that we've got to a point where um, we need to think about the risk in the market because when there's too many people on one side of the ship, that ship will tip, you know, effectively. And that's what it's telling you here is that there is incredible levels of sentiment. Um, now, timing that is absolutely key. It might not happen for a week. It might not happen for two two months. And my best guess is when I look at the um, the macro factors that are out there in in the world yes, the which macro could cause facts, yes the macro facts yes that's what i'm asking so this is this is an email that i'm i'm putting out to to clients tomorrow yeah. and if you yeah i can i can give you anyone who wants to to sign up can be on this it's free it doesn't you don't have to be a client necessarily to, yeah, to get please, it yes, um yeah. but i'm i'm looking at okay so let's look at the global economy the global economy is on the mend it's improving um, the vaccine's being rolled out and it's being rolled out very efficiently in in, in the uae it's it's going really well um, in the U.S., it's 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 doing really. It's, it, it's coming out much faster than than what people anticipated a couple of weeks ago. Now, uh, in the U.K., you know, by the end of the year, they, they, the run rate is that 91% of the country will be vaccinated should they choose to. Most people probably by July. Um, parts of Asia are doing pretty well. Australia's um, lagging where I live, uh, but ultimately the vaccine's working well. Yeah, you know, the the economies are going to open up, and and we're actually talking more about reflation and higher inflation, and when the Fed raise rates and or should we say more like when will they taper their bond purchases so i don't think it's going to be a downturn in economics that's going to cause this i think economics are going to start improving um and most central bank forecasts and uh, are that the economics will improve but that's one thing a downturn in economics would, would 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 be very bad and and cause this risk off sentiment but i think the chances of that happening are very low in fact i think we're looking at the other thing I think what would cause a material downdraft in, in markets would be a policy mistake from a central bank, specifically the Federal Reserve. Um, and that may be um, when we start seeing inflation coming through, and that will probably be in April. If we think about base effects, last April, inflation in the US was very low. So by oh, just yeah. looking at the, the, lot, the change that's happened in inflation from, it, from the previous corresponding period, um, just through base effects alone, will get above 2%. If you have a look at things like the bond market, we have a look at break-even rates. If you have a look at um, you know, what various measures of inflation expectations in the bond market, um, five-year inflation expectations are, are running at 2.3%. They're basically telling you that the Fed is going to achieve its inflation mandate. Um, so I'm concerned that around April time, when they actually start seeing inflation coming through, or maybe even before that time, that the Federal Reserve are going to change their narrative and we risk a a, um, a policy mistake from the Federal Reserve. To me, that's, that's what's, what, what causes this. Real yields have to go higher uh, and that's inflation busted, uh, adjusted bond yields. And you can go to the, the Fed's website, go to the FRED website, um, and you can have a look at the thing called TIPS, yeah, which are I really the most so, important. Yeah. Yeah, I, so I TIPS are the I most am. important instrument in the world right now. Um, for me, the most thing, the, the thing that causes all of this to come unwind is a policy mistake from the Fed um, and real yields going higher. If real yields go higher, then the dollar is going to spike. Volatility is going to go higher. Systematic funds are going to unwind trades and we're going to start seeing markets moving lower. So I, I, I can't see what's going to cause um, this bubble to burst anytime soon. I have the things that I think that would, would cause it the material down, but I don't think they're going to happen for you know a couple of months. And I don't think the Federal Reserve are going to allow it to happen. So you know all I'm saying with these these different measures is that, that we have exuberance at extremities, but I'm looking across my just risk factors and I'm asking myself what causes that. And I don't know at the moment. I have these things that I that I suspect will will do it, but I, I can't see them happening right now. But then again, I didn't expect COVID to happen last February either, and that was a black swan event. So all I'm saying is that be on guard, um, identify the signs and be aware of them. And if they do um, manifest into market volatility, then then we, we need to be cognizant of that. Price is your best guide. If price if bond, real bond yields start moving higher, the dollar starts moving higher, implied volatility will move higher. 
um, and you know equity markets will, will will start moving lower. You'll see um, you know the rate of change rising. You know all these factors that we look at. So the bottom line is is that we're on guard. We've got a pen, we've got a shopping list of factors that could move markets lower, um, and we'll look for those signs. But until they actually start materialising, then then you know for me it's probably you know, we, we stay in our positions. If we're, if we're long risk, if we're long equities, we stay long risk. But we're just cognizant of the signs. We're confident. We're cognizant of, of exuberance that it's in markets and, and that could cause higher volatility. I hope that answers your question. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, I can hear can you. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, great. Another question that about the table regarding to the um, volatility time metrics. I, I just, I want to get how, how you, you, you suppose there is a normal distribution from the statistics that you, uh, the chart, you, you just draw bill chart, right? Which is indicate the normal distribution of the probabilities, which is right. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, um, it's a normal distribution. And then you, you. Sorry, but I need to understand the table for the metric. Let me uh, go back to it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't get it very well. Uh, just I need to understand that the probability for each time happen. That's what our indicator is. Yeah. So yeah, it does use a, a normal distribution. Um, and yeah. Right. The 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 the. the um, but in reality, what, what, it's really normal distribution. Yeah, so um, I don't think so, right? What do you yeah, think? well, so what what we'll do um, with this, and again, you know, I've done this, I've done this talk quite a few times, and and generally, yeah. what you'll find is that the the audience will be lost completely. <laughs> so yeah. you don't go into the you don't go into the the in depth. So you you've got to gradually. Um, coax people proxy, into this it's a, idea. It's a proxy, a proxy measurement, right? All of these. Well, no. So, measurement. so what we do, what what we do as yeah. well as part of the um, information that we send out is we send out the skew. So we send out what we call risk reversals. Um, so if you've got a strongly trending market, clearly a normal distribution is not real, right? Because you know the the idea is if it's going up, if cable's going up, then um, the probabilities in my mind of Price is moving higher, obviously skewed to one side, the right, the right side of the tail, you know, the positive side. So for me, you know, a normal distribution works very well in a sideways trending market with low volatility, which is why, you know, in, if we use mean reverting tools in Bollinger Bands um, in a sideways trending market. I, I use that all the time. Um, you know, you find something that's got very low volatility. Dolly yen's usually a case, and then you see the RSI around 50, and you know, Bollinger Bands tight. You know, you can use that very well, and that's that, that's you know very much a, a normal distribution. But if you're seeing something that's moving high up and, and, and impulsive move higher, with the rate of change moving strongly as well, then what we would do is we would skew. Um, we would obviously go into the trade looking to to, to be long. Um, we would use this to understand our, our risk to the short side, but we also look at risk reversals. So we're looking at um, call volatility minus put volatility and see how the option market's skewed in that as well. And we'd factor that in. It starts getting a little bit more complicated, which is um, you know, not what I wanted to do to people who are new to this concept. We just want to really understand that, that, that yes, there is sure. a mechanism for understanding expected yes. movement. Um, and we can use a normal distribution in most of the cases, but in a strongly trending market, of course, the new distributions or the new price moves will probably be, there's a higher degree of outcome that there'll probably be positive ones, which is on the right-hand side of the um, of the bell curve. So yeah, that 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 becomes slightly skewed towards the right-hand uh, tail. So yeah, your question's a brilliant question, um, but then we start getting into the nuts and bolts of this. And something we put out to people is, is when I'm looking at cable, for example, and I use that as an example, um, you know, you want to be on, uh, for, for me, as someone who trades a four hour charts and daily charts, and my time frame in the market is a lot longer than people who are scalping, for example. So I might hold a trade for an hour. I might you know, hold my trade for a few or four days. You know, who knows? Um, 
depends on how the trade's performing and whether I'm hitting that 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 profit target that I'm that I'm ideally going for. Um, but we're looking at the skew of optionality to tell you how the market's thinking, and then and that is perhaps the best market sentiment indicator. So if call volatility is trading at a sizable premium to put volatility, you generally see that a very very bullish market, and you, it works incredibly well in gold. When you get sentiment over oversold and put volatility starts trading at a premium to call volatility, you tend to see um, you tend to see gold actually having a, a, an outperformance in that in that situation. So we look at trend change based on that. But yeah, I mean it's a brilliant question. In trending markets, the normal distribution doesn't work as well. We need to factor that in um, and, and work out here. But but ultimately. Um, in no, no, most cases, it's, a, it's, a, it's good, Yanni, the way that it's really explaining the way that the movement, all, all of us know that risk management is a proxy management, or even though the, that we can feel the risk, but we cannot just make it in numbers. So that's why we yeah. do some, some approximate. But I need really to thank you so much for your yeah. time. I mean, look, some, people, some people will use um, you know, value at risk models or CVAR and, and understand the potential loss. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't work like that myself, but... Um, if you're understanding movement, and yeah, you do need to adjust it. But for me, a lot of what we're seeing here in terms of implied move is based on what's happened and realized vol. So probably about 70% of the move is, is based on what's happened. But then there's also an element of projected move. So looking at the you know, what's in what's in the data in the 24 hours ahead, what's in the data if you're using weekly options, then you know, we've got non-farm payrolls, have we got a Fed speaker, how could they change this? And they're projecting uh, an expected volatility on that as well. So for me, um, based on the indicators that we have, um, it's about as powerful as we get. And you can trade volatility in the market through straddles and strangles. And, and if people think, if you think that that implied volatility is too low and the expected movement um, is too low. You, you you can go and buy those volatility structures, or you can sell them. And, and selling volatility has been great. So, yeah, people people use these as 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 the key inputs to pricing volatility structures, which we trade. Anyway, thank you so much. Really, it's My a pleasure. brilliant session, and thank you for your time. And we are very happy that you are with us uh, this time. Hopefully, that we can see you next time. Chris. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, the my if anyone's on Twitter, my my Twitter handle is yeah, uh, at Chris West yeah. underscore PS. They, I think you could probably see it on the slide here. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch, with, us, we, we can need this this uh, uh, this session with the PowerPoint with, with PDF file. Can you send or email? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can. I, can I, I, yeah, we can give it to the organisers. Uh, they can send it through. It's um, a brilliant uh, one. Uh, I like it anyway. Thank you so much for Thank your you very effort. much. I really appreciate it. That's my email address there. Um, if you want to get on my distribution, um, you don't need to be a client. Um, obviously, I'd like that. But um, you, uh, you, can, you can reach out and we'll put you on and you can, we, we'll send this out, daily commentary and also the, the expected movements there. So I appreciate um, everyone sp sticking with me and uh, hopefully um, it gave some thoughts about how, how I think about the world. Um, and if there's any questions around trading, um, we're using these systems or you know, understanding a bit more about what Pepperstone do, then then yeah, do reach out to myself. I'll be more than happy to, to spend some time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cool. I'm going to leave. So I bid you all farewell. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.